Welcome to the Realtors Report. I am your Dearborn Realtors member and host, Daryl Powell Lee. Today we have Demetrius Cole from Greater Illinois Title. Glad to be here. How you doing, Demetrius? Ma'am, I'm excited. Excited. Glad, glad you can make it. Glad you can make it. We brought you in today because Title is so important, but a lot of our viewers don't understand the importance of Title. So, could you talk a little bit about what Title is? Okay, absolutely. Uh, first, I want to say um, again, I'm with Greater Illinois Title. I've been in the Title Insurance industry for about 20 years and various aspects of Title Insurance. Um, I've sold Title Insurance. I've closed residential. Um, commercial deals, um, kind of did it all. So um, title insurance is very important, and it's very important because real estate is uh, your most value, you know, deal that you're going to make in your lifetime. It's one of the biggest uh, possessions that you're going to acquire. So you want to make sure that it's protected, um, that it's insured, um, and that it won't, you know, it won't go out, leave out of your hands anytime soon. So to make a long story short, title insurance is an insurance policy um, that you. Um, the buyer or the seller pays for at the time of the purchase. Um, it protects you from things that happen before you purchase the property. So when you What's think it? of insurance, mm -hmm. you think of car insurance, you think of health insurance, it covers you for things after you sign the policy. So you get a car insurance policy, you have an accident, you're covered. You go, you get health insurance, you go to the doctor, you're covered. But title insurance is different because it protects what happened before you purchased the property. So say, for example, you you have bought a property from a seller who didn't pay for the roofing or didn't pay for the floors. Um, there are certain liens that can be filed that can encumber your property. So title insurance, is in essence, in essence, protects you from things that you may not be aware of when you purchase the property. So if I understand you correctly, if... If I'm purchasing a property, mm -hmm. right, and there was work done to that property prior to me purchasing it. Correct. And uh, the individuals that did that work, the vendors that did that work, were not paid Correct. for the work. And subsequently, the, the property was sold to me. I now own this property. I got title insurance. Right. Does title insurance, are you saying that that protects me from that vendor coming after me for the money that was... Absolutely, absolutely. So the the vendor, whoever did the roofing, the floors, they're going to get their money regardless. So it's the point of who's going to pay for that. Obviously, if you bought a property, you know, with 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 your money, you know, you don't want to be responsible for something that the previous seller did. Um, so that's where title insurance comes in. It can be roofing, it can be floors, it can be taxes. A lot of people don't pay their taxes, you know, on time, and so you can get a tax lien, or you can have. Uh, uh, lost heir that came out of the blue that said, hey, mom and dad wasn't supposed to sell their property. You know, I'm the one that's supposed to be, I'm the owner of that property. So title insurance will then come into effect then and clear up any um, money that's due to a vendor or to a lost heir or pay any taxes that might have been missed. Wow. So, so uh, with title insurance, it's not just a uh physical protection of the property it's administrative things too as absolutely well. taxes uh, and uh fines or things of that nature that that the, the property may have absolutely so when we do when we get a title order our processors would check tax records um, they would check check state lien records to make sure that the buyer or the seller doesn't have any child support liens employment liens because all those things can attach itself to the property as well um we check public records, of course, for how many mortgages on the property. Um, so we do a lot of those kind of searches and a, a variety of databases to make sure that we have all our I's dotted and T's crossed to make sure that we're insuring a, a property that's clear, clear and free of any liens. So for our viewers, we know there's two sides to a transaction. There's Correct. the buyer, there's the seller. Uh, who normally uh, contacts contacts the the title company is that is that the buyer side is that the seller side could it be either what have you seen mostly so it varies state by state so in illinois um we are an attorney state so the seller's attorney in order uh, in essence places the title order um with the title company now you go to a different state um there, there might not be an attorney. The seller would be responsible for ordering that title insurance, or the realtor might be responsible for placing that order. Um, and it just varies who pays for it. In some states, the seller pays for it. In some states, the buyer pays for it. Um, theoretically, uh, there's a lot of discussion to say it should be a buyer's charge because it protects the buyer's interest in the property. Um, it just so happens that in Illinois, 
that we have the seller pay for it and it benefits the buyer. Um, but I've seen it done in multiple ways. Now, I, uh, as a real estate broker, uh, when it's time for me to get paid, mm -hmm. right, right, it's normally the title company that's cutting my check. Correct. Uh, can you talk about how monies are dispersed by the title company and why the title company is the one to do that? Absolutely. So as a title company, we're kind of the independent party um, in the transaction. You know, we're independent from the seller, we're independent from the buyer, we're independent from attorneys, even though we might have working relationships with them, we're independent from them, and we're also independent from the lender. Um, so in essence, if you're buying a property with a loan, our customer, we're making sure that we're securing the buyer's lender. We're protecting their interest in the property because they're the one fronting some of the money. So in essence, the lender in that situation would be our main customer that we want to make sure that we protect the money that they're wiring to us. Um, so again, we collect instructions from, every, from everybody. Instructions are very key in our field. We follow instructions from the buyer's attorney to tell us what the, what the buyer's fees should be. We take instructions from the seller's attorney to let us know, hey, we're going to be paying off this mortgage. We're going to be providing tax credits to the buyer for this amount of money. Um, and we also get instructions from the lender to say, hey, we cannot close this loan if we haven't verified employment or we haven't verified where the buyer's money is coming from. So in essence, we follow instruction from all these different parties, and then we just kind of round it out and make sure everybody is accounted for every Every I is dotted, every T is crossed, and also we make sure we have all the money accounted for. We have to make sure we have all the money in from the buyer, cash to close. We have to make sure we have the money in from the lender in our account before we disperse any funds. Um, and then after that, it's just following instructions, and we pretty much pay whoever you all tell us to pay. <laughs> that's a very we, we try not to make any assumptions <laughs> when you're dealing with dollars and cents. We right. want clear instructions. Right. That's a very, very involved process. Um, I have to ask, with with so many different parties that you're answering to in one transaction, uh, typically how many staff members does it take for one transaction to come to completion? Oh, man. So that's that varies depending on the kind of volume you have. Um, I've been, like I said, I've been in the industry for about 20 years. Um, I've worked with smaller title companies where we have a two or three man operation. Um, but again, that's not dealing with a lot of volume. And I've also worked with, you know, larger national companies uh, such as Greater Illinois Title. And we have um, offices in different states. Um, we have offices in Illinois, Florida, Indiana, um, and some work in Wisconsin. So we have a staff of maybe about 100 people on staff. And that's, you know, people who's going, again, searching county records, tax records, um, preparing commitments. Um, we have accounting department making sure we protect the money that's wired to us. That's very important. We have to protect the money. Um, we also have people that close the transactions. Um, then we have people that prepare the policy. So it's, um, it depends on the volume, but anywhere between, you know, 10 to 100 people, um, to effectively, you know, run a, a successful settlement company. Okay, so with with uh, our viewers who are looking to purchase property mm -hmm. and they're absolutely going to have title insurance. Absolutely. Um, I wouldn't say suggest closing without title insurance. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like something that's necessary if, if, if you're going to make, uh, for most uh, Americans, the largest purchase that they'll ever make. Uh, I, I have to wonder, how long does that insurance last? You used um, you used the metaphor of, of car right. insurance, and you have to pay that either every six months, right. every year, monthly payments. Right. Is that the same thing with title insurance? Am I paying monthly? Am I paying annually? Great question. Do I have to re-up after 10 years? How does that work? Great question. So with title insurance, um, you pay at the time of closing. One-time fee, you pay at the time you purchase the property. Um, and typically there's two type of insurance policies. You have an owner's policy um, that protects the, the, own, the buyer's interest in the properties from any encumbrances that might come up, come up. And we also have a loan policy. If you, get a, if you obtain a loan to purchase the property, your lender will require you to purchase a loan insurance prop, uh, policy as well. And that protects the lender's interest in case there was a foreclosure or a lost heir um, that is claiming ownership of the property. So they have their interest protected as well. Um, so, uh, what was the what was the initial question? <laughs> I forgot, bro. The question, no worries, no worries. I mean, it's it's a it's a lot of information, uh, and our viewers are very thankful, right. and uh, we're right. thankful for you coming oh, okay. back for this. So, uh, so yeah. the question, right? I remember now. You remember? I remember okay. now. So it's a one-time fee. Right. You pay it at the closing, and it and it 
protects you for the life of the how long you own the property. Okay. So you don't have to pay any extra fees, um, no monthly fees. You pay for it one time, and it protects you as long as you own that property. Now, if you refinance in the future, you might have to pay for a different loan policy because you're going to have a different lender, different loan amount, different interest rate. Mm -hmm. uh, so you might have to refinance into a different loan policy. Okay. Um, but the owner's policy protects you for the as long as you own the property. And will that affect what will that affect uh, for those that need to refi or refinance? Mm -hmm. uh, is that going to affect my title at all? Would that affect the title? No, it shouldn't all? affect title at all because pretty much your when you purchase the property, if you obtain a loan, you're going to have a mortgage that's recorded um, with the county records to show you yeah, John Doe um, purchased the loan or obtained a loan for five hundred. Mm -hmm. Then once you obtain a loan loan, you're going to have to, uh, the lender will repair a release, a release of mortgage. So that release will be recorded with the county record to show, hey, John Doe paid off this loan for 500000 Then he's going to open up a new loan for 400000 So that it won't really affect your title. It will just keep the chain. It's called We call it a chain of title. Okay. So the chain of title, um, in essence, is a record from the time that property was built up until the current day. So it won't affect the chain of title at all. Understood. So if uh, I, I'm purchasing a property mm -hmm. and, uh, well, actually, I'm selling a property. Right. And uh, since the seller is paying for uh, the the title search, okay. correct, the insurance of that, right. that property, and I'm instructing my uh, attorney because Illinois is attorney state. Correct. I am asking my attorney or directing my attorney to a title company what are some of the questions I should be asking or, or, or how should I interview a title company to know that they're the right ones for me? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you want to do research. Okay. You know, you have uh, smartphones, tablets um, that has abundant, abundance of knowledge. Right. Um, so you want to have a title company that's reputable. Any reputable title company will have a, a strong digital presence. So that if you go Google Greater Illinois Title, you will see reviews from previous customers. You also see complaints. You know, it's not out of the ordinary to see complaints from a title company. Um, we're all humans. Humans make mistakes, um, but it's how those issues are addressed. Um, you want to check the locations for the title companies. You want to want to make sure that the service is the area that you live in and you're selling the property in. I want to I want to stop you right there, okay. if I can. Absolutely. Um, why is proximity important? Uh, in terms, you said servicing the area that right. you're in. So there are title companies uh, that won't service Chicago, or are are we saying that? Uh, if if the the title company is in proximity to the property, it it, it goes further right. in terms of the relationship between you and that title right. company. Well, uh, 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 the, a big complaint that I hear a lot over my career is, especially when you deal with properties on the south side, you know, west side of Chicago, um, a lot of those closings, you have to go out to Naperville. Or Skokie to close those kind of mm -hmm. deals because those I've, are I've done it. <laughs> those I've are the, the companies that the attorneys have relationships with. Okay. Um, or the attorney might be out in that area that day. Um, but really it should be what's convenient for the people who are buying and selling. Okay. So if you close if you're buying a property on the south side of Chicago, you want to make sure that that property is that you're not driving to Geneva to close a property and on the south side of Chicago or in Orland Park. So while it's not a big thing, obviously, if you're going to buy a home, you're going to go wherever that, you know, <laughs> wherever it takes you. But right. theoretically, you want to choose a title company that services the neighbor neighborhood that you live in and you're buying in. Okay, so I want to switch gears uh, uh, very quickly uh, from uh, what is title, why is title important. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know, like, what's the largest or the biggest most pressing issue mm -hmm. um, that's facing the title industry right now? Right now, the biggest concern, and it should be a concern for everybody, whether you are a realtist, whether you're a loan officer, whether you're an attorney, whether you're buying, selling, um, wire fraud and cybersecurity threats are the biggest issue facing our industry right now. Um, criminals have become smarter. They know that mostly everybody here um, handling business transactions from a smartphone, from a tablet. Um, from email, so it's very easily it's very easy to hack into some of these devices, um, steal information, uh, forge documents such as wire instructions. That's a big thing that we're facing right now, where people are hacking emails, um, changing wire instructions, and pretty uh, for the most part, money are being money is being stolen. 
wow. from, from potential buyers, sellers, um, payoff lenders. Um, so we have to be due, due diligent and spread the word of this issue with cybersecurity and wire fraud and advise everybody that when, whenever if you're buying a home, you receive wire instructions, pick up the phone, call the title company, verify those wire instructions before you, you know, send money. Okay. Um, and even for us, when we, even for myself, if I close a transaction, if I have to wire money mm -hmm. to pay off a lender or wire money to pay off a seller who just sold their property, I have to pick up the phone and call said seller or said lender and just to confirm, hey, I just want to confirm your wire instructions just to make sure that money is not stolen. Because once it's gone, most of the time it's, it's extremely impossible to get it back. Wow. Um, once it's overseas, it's pretty much... You might as well forget about it. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, if if um, I'm in the position to uh, fund mm -hmm. uh, this wire, and I get an email, right, right, and so this email is going to have the name of the institution that I've been dealing with. It's right. going to have my name in it. It's going. It may even have the name of the person I've been dealing with. Absolutely. And that email. Absolutely. When I receive that email, I shouldn't just follow instruction. I need to call and speak to someone Absolutely. personally before I do that. Absolutely. You want to pick up the phone um, and just just pick up the phone. I know I, <laughs> I know even myself, I know I, I don't like, you know, really calling a lot of people and having a lot of conversations with people. Right. I'm more of the text, text, email, and I'm done. Got but it. when you're dealing with dollar and cents, it's just that extra step that you want to take to say, hey, I got these Y instructions. I just want to make sure that it's accurate before I send money. Um, because the hackers, they can get into your email. They can monitor every email that comes into your inbox. Wow. Any email you send out, they can monitor and find out when is the closing date, what time is the code, how much is the wire I have to wire in, what's the title, what's the title company that is being wired to. They can sit there from anywhere in the, in the world and, and watch this activity, and they just wait for the right time to pounce. So, for example, I've been in closings with attorneys, then I get an email from an attorney that I'm in the closing with instructing me to change wire instructions. While the attorneys are right there next to me. So I have the conversation, hey, did you just send me an email to, to send wire instructions, to send money somewhere else? And they'll tell me, no, I, I didn't send you anything. So that tells me that the criminal knew what time the, what time the closing was, knew where it was closing, and knew the perfect time to send me those wire instructions to try to divert that, those funds. Realtors Nation, Absolutely. when you get an email with wire instructions per Demetrius call, please call the individual that supposedly sent you that email so you don't lose a lot of money. Lots I of imagine money. it's a lot of money during Lots these of transactions. Millions of dollars are lost every year with wire fraud. And it's very a small amount of those funds I ever recouped. Wow. Absolutely. So it's, a, it's a definitely an epidemic within our industry, um, and it's kind of like the gift and the curse. Technology is the gift and the curse. You know, technology helps things become more efficient, more faster, but at the same time, if you have a, a criminal mindset, it can be very easy to prey upon unsuspecting victims as well. Realtors Nation, uh, I want to speak for brokers right now, if we could. Absolutely. Um, I like to speak for brokers. So as a real estate broker, uh, and closing a transaction. I have been at the title company for three hours. <laughs> Why am I there for two and a half, three, 90 minutes? Why is it taking so long to close this transaction? That's a good question. I often, I often ask myself, why am I in the closing for four hours? Um, and there's really not one answer okay. that I can put my hands on. But give me some examples. Because <laughs> like like I'm sitting across from my client. Right. They've signed all the paperwork. Right. They're already nervous waiting to get keys. And right. they do not understand why it's been four hours, three hours. We're still sitting here, right. and I can't explain to them right. why we're still sitting here. So give me some examples. Give me some points on why right. it may take that long to close a transaction. My number one on my list would be um, waiting on why funds to hit the account. So a lot of times we have to wait for the lender, say a lender, to wire money to fund the transaction. If you're dealing with a lender that's out of state, California, or a different you know, time zone, that wire can take a long time to hit, especially if they don't send it right away. Um, if you wire money from overseas, especially I deal with a lot of uh, cash deals where money is coming from overseas, 
and there's a turnaround time for that. Um, so that's definitely a big issue when people don't wire funds um, ahead of closing. If you do it the day before, if it's the end of the month, there's a good chance that that money could be delayed. Um, the second issue, walkthrough issues. You know, that that's something we just can't help. Mm -hmm. If You know, if there's a lot of rain that, you know, came the night before or the seller didn't broom clean the property or the seller took down some drapes when they wasn't supposed to and then you have to, you know, kind of argue with, you know, go back and forth with that. So walkthrough issues is a big... Can, can, can I jump in right Absolutely. there with, with the walkthrough issues because uh, I have firsthand uh, experience <laughs> um, in terms of how that can halt um, the transaction closing. So let me ask you when, uh, I, you know, the attorney comes to you and they say, hey, um, the, the walkthrough, there were some repairs that weren't made. Right. We want to hold money back right. from the transaction. Um, how do you hold that money? Where does it go? Depends on who's holding the money. Okay. So a lot of times the seller's attorney or the buyer's attorney will agree to hold the money. And sometimes they want a third party, such as the title company, to hold the money. If there's a tensuous closing between sellers and buyer where they have zero trust, you know, they would want an independent party to kind of hold that money um, and won't disperse it until we get the blessing from the seller and the buyer. Um, and it depends on the lenders. A lot of times lenders, does, they do not like uh, holdbacks for those kind of things. Okay. If they're lending you money, they want to make sure that, you know, they're lending money on a, a property that's livable. <laughs> that there is no water in the in the in the basement or no uh, not a, a leak coming from the roof. So depending on what kind of escrow it is and what we're holding money back for, that can be another reason why that closing is delayed because the lender has to get it approved, has to go to the higher ups on the lending institution to make sure they would approve that 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 escrow to be held. So I imagine uh, uh, in, in talking about wire fraud, mm -hmm. when those monies are held back and then that email comes from the the buyers. Uh, attorney that right. says, okay, yeah, you can release uh, the rest of the money now. Right. Uh, I imagine it's the same process as where you need to call the actual buyer's agent and get them on the line and make sure that right. the email was sent and, and the information that you received is correct. Is, right. is, is that the normal process? Absolutely. Anything, any check we cut is always a, a level of we have to verify, check and verify that we are doing what's instructed for us to do because there has been situations where one party might say, oh, release that money back to the seller, and the buyer might be like, oh, we still have an issue that we haven't accounted for, so don't release the money. So you never can take one person's word for it. That's why if we are holding money in escrow, we have to make sure, whether it's earnest money, whether it's an escrow for post-possession post escrow or anything, we have to make sure that we have clear instructions from both sides that we have the okay to release said funds um, because if we don't follow instructions, then we have to pay a claim. Got so. So just to, just to recap, uh, if I get title insurance, that title insurance is good for the life of... However long you own the property. For, for, however long I own the property. If I decide to gift that property to uh, uh, a cousin, mm -hmm. an aunt, right. son or daughter, right. does that title insurance transfer? Just depends on how the transfer was done. Okay. If you just quick claim... Um, a property there's a such thing as quick claim deed where you just um, sign a deed, say, hey, I'm John Doe, I want to quick claim this property to Jane Doe. Um, so in that situation, title will switch hands, the owner's policy um, theoretically should still be intact, theoretically. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's different from state to state. From state from to from state. From state to state, okay. absolutely. Okay, because uh, as you said, Illinois is a, an attorney state right. and not all are. Um, I want to thank you for coming out no, today. I'm, I'm uh, glad you had me. Uh, Realtors Nation wants to thank you for coming out today. You've really educated us on the importance of title and why it makes so much sense. Absolutely. Uh, so, again, uh, this is Demetrius Cole. Absolutely. And you are with? Greater Illinois Title. I am Daryl Powell Lee. I am a Dearborn Realtors member, real estate broker. This is the Realtors Report. We will see you next month. Thank you. Thanks.